for you tonight. We love you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so 1 Peter chapter 3, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been walking through the end of 1 Peter 2, the beginning of 1 Peter 3, and we've been talking about this household code. Uh, that again, the context of 1 Peter, Peter's writing to these believers who are dispersed abroad, right? He's writing to people really all over the Roman Empire. He's writing to both Jews and Gentiles, but he's writing in a context where people are experiencing persecution for their faith. And in particular, the Roman government is kind of looking at Christians as a scapegoat for the problems that they are experiencing. And so one of the things that Peter emphasizes is... uh, First in chapter one, don't forget, you have a new identity, a new inher- you, you have a, a new birth that leads to an inheritance that's imperishable, unfading. And in chapter two, he doubles down on that, and he talks about how we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so the first couple of chapters are all about your new identity in Christ, about what Christ has done for you, about how he's redeemed you, and how he's called you to walk out that newness of life as believers. But then as we get into the end of chapter 2 and then in chapter 3, he gets very practical and he says, okay, now that you've got this new identity, now that you've been adopted into a new family, we want to walk this out as believers in such a way that our lives bring no reproach on the name of Christ. And again, in a hostile cultural environment, this is incredibly important. Peter is essentially saying, We live in a culture that does not like us. We live in a culture that's very skeptical of us. We live in a political climate where the powers that be in the world, and remember it's very likely that Nero was reigning as Peter wrote this, that that, that people are looking for an excuse. They are looking for us to fail. They're looking for reasons to say, well, these Christians are dangerous. And so he says, we want to walk in a way that we give them no excuse. And in particular, what he says is, we have a great example to follow, the example of Jesus, right? That Jesus suffered in a way where he didn't, he didn't deride, he, didn't, he wasn't disrespectful, he literally suffered unjustly for us. And so as, as we go through the, the household code, and we're kind of finishing it tonight and moving on from it, we see that, that when it comes to even slaves to their masters, or husbands and wives, and wives and husbands, uh, when it comes to the practical ways that we relate both outside publicly and inside the walls of our own home, we are to basically live in such a way that Christ is our example, okay? Now, as we continue that, Peter tonight, as we come to 1 Peter chapter 3, He moves on from slaves and masters, he moves on from husbands and wives, and now he's going to come back to really some general statements about how every believer, no matter what social context or social relationship you find yourself in, about how every believer is to relate to one another and how we are to relate to the world. And so before we just start the text, I want to to get that thought in our mind, that there's always kind of... uh, Uh, two ways of existing as a Christian. And here's what I mean by that. We exist as believers within a community of faith, right? Which means that there is a certain way that we are to relate to one another as brothers and sisters. And so within the church, we're to love one another, we're to submit to one another, we're to bear one another's burdens. All of those one another commandments are given to us in our relationship with other believers, and this is, this is so crucial for Paul, Peter, James, John, all the apostles. They tell us the way that we love our brothers and sisters is evidence that we truly belong to Jesus. We're all part of a new family. So that's the first thing. We as brothers and sisters in Christ are to relate to one another as brothers and sisters. But then the second kind of mode of existence is the way that believers are to relate to the world. And this is where Peter is going to talk about both. He's going to talk about the way that we are to relate to one another inside the family. And then he's going to talk about the way that the family is to relate to the outside and watching world. Now, of course, as believers, what do we know? That for us, we are to love one another, but also we are to love one another with the view that we want to bring those who are outside to the inside. And and here's the reason I, I, I want to frame it that way. We've got to understand that for Paul and Peter and James and John and Jesus and and really the entire New Testament teaches this, that's why we are called to live pure and reverent lives. That's why we are called to live as Christians for the glory of God in, in a way that we truly love each other because we want the outside world to see there is a difference 
Not the difference, and please hear me, not the difference of self-righteousness, not the difference of perfection, but a true love that we have for one another as we relate to one another within the body. Now, that'll become more clear, and, and hopefully we'll talk about some more practical applications of that, but I just want to frame this because the mistake that a lot of believers make is they will take verses that really are primarily about the way we treat one another as believers, and they'll almost apply that to the way that, we, that we're supposed to treat the world, or vice versa. And I'll explain that in more detail in a minute. I just want to frame it that way as we continue on. So, so let's end the household code and move on, again, considering Christ as our example. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Finally, so he's ending the household code, right? He's ending this section. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic, love one another, and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing, okay? Now, just pause right here and notice that we have both of those kind of worlds uh, going on at the same time. When he says, all of you be like-minded, he's obviously saying to believers, you are to be like-minded with other believers, right? In other words, for Christians, there is supposed to be a unity, a unity that's ultimately produced and flows from the gospel, that because we're all followers of Christ, yes, we have different personalities, of course, we have different giftings, and all of those things are gifts of God, but we are to have a common purpose. So he says, be like-minded, be sympathetic, and love one another, and be compassionate and humble. These are primarily attributes, and yes, it's true that we're supposed to be compassionate to those outside of the, of the faith, we're supposed to be humble in relation to everyone, but those are primarily ways that we relate to one another, we're to love one another, we're to be sympathetic toward one another. You think of Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 when he says, when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer together. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice together. So there's this symbiotic relationship. There's this understanding that we are all in this together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So he says, again, love one another, be compassionate, be humble. But then in verse 9, it's interesting because here he's speaking both of our relationship with one another, but also he's going to start to turn the table toward our outward facing relationship with the world. So he says, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. Now, how do we know that he's kind of changing the dynamic here? Because again, there's a couple of reasons. First, it wouldn't be Christians that are insulting. It wouldn't be Christians that are persecuting Christians. Now he's starting to talk about the way that they relate to those who are insulting and persecuting. So just textually, that makes sense. But then secondly, remember, the underlying, the underlying objective here is Peter wants us to see Christ as our example. And of course, he's already said, when Christ suffered and died, he was insulted, he was persecuted, and yet he suffered silently. So, Again, I'll just, I'll just try and summarize and say it as plainly as I can. We are to love and be humble and compassionate and sympathetic toward one another as believers. And that authenticates the message, right? It authenticates the fact that we truly belong to Jesus. But then, as we turn from facing inward to facing outward, Paul says we don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, we give a blessing since we were called to this, Okay? So th this is, this is a, again, a difficult thing for us, I, I think, to accept because, of course, what do we want to do whenever, whenever we're insulted? What do we want to do whenever we're cursed? We want to respond in kind. And this is where Peter reminds us, okay, we've got to fight our flesh. We've got to walk out this new identity. Why? He's going to explain this in a minute because he says the favor of God rests always upon the righteous. If the righteous suffer for righteousness then God's eyes are on you, which means his favor is on you. But if we walk according to our flesh and we say, okay, well, guess what? You got to fight fire with fire. You got to fight evil with evil. If we fall into that trap, then all of a sudden we no longer receive the favor of blessing of God. All of a sudden we are placing ourselves in a spot where God can't bless us because to bless us would actually be to, to lead us astray. Let's look at it. Let's keep going because Peter explains it. Notice in verse 10, he says, for, in other words, he's about to explain what he just said, that we are to not insult, but rather we're to give a blessing. He says, for the one who wants to love life and to see good days, 
Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Now, pause right here. Uh, If you, at least in my translation, this is bolded, which means that it's a quotation. Some of you might have uh, translations where it does that for you, indicating that Peter here is quoting something from the Old Testament. And in particular, he's quoting from Psalm 34. And Psalm 34 is an an appropriate psalm to, to choose from. Because essentially it says, God is going to look with favor and protection on those who are righteous, but those who are evil, God is ultimately going to judge and condemn. In fact, the language of Psalm 34 is actually very strong, basically saying that God is going to wipe them away, wipe those who are evil away. So he quotes this saying, the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Now, there are a few things I think we can can look at and see here. Notice that Peter says, those who love life. This is important because it helps us to guard against kind of a martyr complex. You know what I mean by a martyr complex? That some people live to feel like they're persecuted. You know, some people are, are, are actually looking and tr- actually trying to provoke people to, to, you know, be mean to them or, or do something to them that says they're oppressed. And Peter here is trying to tell us, listen, our goal is not to, you know, poke the bear and then get attacked and then say, oh my goodness, the evil bear. No, we are the kind of people who we love life. I love actually how, how Paul talks about it. When Paul says that, uh, and I, I believe this is... Uh, Oh my goodness. I, I believe it's in First Thessalonians. Maybe in, in uh, uh, I can't remember where it is. Someone can Google this for me so I don't seem foolish. But where Paul, I believe in First Thessalonians where he says that our goal should be to live quiet and peaceable lives. No, it's First Timothy chapter 3 where he says our goal is to lead quiet and peaceable lives. Therefore, we are to pray. No, it's First Timothy 2. Uh, He's to pray, someone can Google it so that I'm not just struggling up here. He says, we are to pray for our rulers and authorities because our goal as Christians is to live quiet and peaceable lives, right? And, 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 And what is he trying to say? He's trying to say the same thing as Peter. Or I believe, rather we should say, what's the Holy Spirit trying to say? He's trying to get us to see, right? Our goal isn't to go poke the bear Our goal isn't to go, you know, try and become a martyr. Our goal is to simply to shine the light of God, to do it boldly, to do it faithfully, but to do it in such a way where we don't invite uh, invite, uh, oppression or persecution because we like it. And and I'm not explaining this very well, but, but let me just try and come back. Some people love the identity of feeling oppressed. And so what they will do is they will actually go and intentionally try to tick people off. Or they will intentionally make themselves obnoxious. And then when someone calls them on it, they'll say, whoa, you're persecuting me for my faith. Or you're persecuting me for my beliefs. And there's something in all of us that probably wants to say, no, I think they're just calling you out for being a jerk. And honestly, you're kind of being a jerk. Why do I say this? Because again, Psalm 34, and we'll talk about this in a minute when we get to verse 15, but Psalm 34 says, for the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Peter is trying to, and and the psalmist is trying to as well, show us what it looks like to seek God, to want to follow him. And that means wanting to follow him and committing yourself to righteousness, not adopting that kind of wrong attitude. But notice again, he says, let his teeth keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Whenever you feel wronged, it's easy to want to really complain about it, right? I mean, uh, and and listen, and sometimes in certain contexts, that's that's good and right thing to do. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, You know, if uh, I, had a, I had a friend the other day. He ordered something off of uh, an online website that's very popular. I won't name it. 
uh, but he ordered something. It was very expensive, and he was given, instead of a new part, he was given a used part, and it was like a $1,500 purchase for his boat. Uh, and so he received it, and it was a totally used part. It wasn't what he ordered, so he sent it back. Well, they refused to issue a refund because they said, you sent us back a used part. And so it became a whole big deal. He, he kind of had to go up the scale and had to learn all about the customer service of this whole thing. And eventually it, it kind of came to, hey, you, you guys really wronged me and this is bad. You need to give me my $1,500 back. Kind of got ugly a little bit. And listen, I'm not saying that as a Christian, turn the other cheek means you don't get your $1,500 refund, okay? But what I am saying is when it comes to Christians, there is a line that we can never cross, right? We can, we, and, and here's, here's how I think it looks for us. You can stand up for your rights, and you should. And this is, again, this is, again, what Baptists have believed traditionally, is that not only should we stand up for our rights, but we should also stand up for the rights of others who find themselves in minority status, so that if we find ourselves in minority status, they would do the same for us, right? It's, in other words, it's not enough just for me to advocate for my rights. I should advocate for the rights of anyone whose rights are being trampled on. Um, but the key is, we can't lie. We can't practice deceit. People say, we use the phrase, lose your witness. And that's kind of a throwaway phrase, but it's true. We've got to be people who protect the integrity of our witness. And, 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 and Peter's in a minute going to talk about doing it with a good conscience. You know, that doesn't mean you don't stand up for yourself, but you don't do it by complaining, you don't do it by lying, you don't do it through deceit and essentially saying, well, if other people are lying, then I've got to lie to catch up, right? If other people are cheating, then I've got to cheat to catch up. You've got to, you've got to do the same thing or else you're going to fall behind. That's always going to be the temptation. But Peter says we can't succumb to it. And notice what it says in verse 11, it's not just speaking, let him turn away from evil and do what is good, let him seek peace and pursue it. I, I want you to notice the active nature of that. Like we are to actively, intentionally seek peace as much as it's possible for us. And this is where, again, Paul says the exact same thing, where he says in, uh, in Romans uh, 12, as much as it's up to you, live at peace with all men. As much as it depends on you, you are to seek it actively. Now, what do we know? Even though we might actively seek peace, that doesn't mean that others are, are going to do the same. But again, we can't, be, we can't be the one who starts it. We can't be the one who provokes it. And this is something, by the way, that, that we're not going to fool God, right? You know, uh, oftentimes as a parent, I have, to, I have to really weigh whenever I hear someone, you know, yelling from the basement and I've got to be like, all right, kids, come on up, you know, tell me, tell me. And it's kind of courtroom scene with dad. I've told you about Selah. She sees, you know, call the first witness. Um, it, it's like when they come up, I have to realize sometimes I, I just don't have the ability to discern exactly what happened. One person says it's the other person's fault, they started it. The other person says it's the other person's fault, they started it. Usually then they just both get in trouble. But my point is, like, sometimes we just can't discern. But here's what Peter is saying. God does not have that problem. And God, please listen to me, is not going to judge Christians and non-Christians by the same standard. He's not going to look at us and say, well, you know what? Yeah, the world lies, so it's okay if you do. Or the world does evil, so you had to do that just to, to, to stay in the race or whatever. No. And, and this is, again, by the way, why I think it's such an important thing to remember that calling yourself a believer is a big deal. And this, this might be lost. I may be shouting into the wind. But one of the things that, that truly does grind on me in a way I can't even explain is when people claim to be Christians because they believe it gives them some kind of social advantage. When you claim to be a follower of Christ, you are inviting a greater degree of scrutiny. You are saying, God is my father and I am making myself responsible to him. And this is where believers, I, I think we just have honestly just way, way, way too low of standard when it comes to people who claim the name of Christ. 
I, it, this is, I'll just speak for me personally, but I, I truly believe this is born of a biblical conviction. Like, I would rather people not claim to be a believer than claim to be a believer and then live lives that, that reflect nothing of the gospel. Because I truly believe that does deep damage. It does deep damage. Um, and that's true, that's true at every level, by the way. That's true at the personal level. It's true at, 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 at a national level. It's true at every level. That if someone claims to be a Christian, but then lives a life that denies the name of Christ, it does great damage to the gospel. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute, but let's, let's keep reading verse 12. It says, let him seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Just notice this from an observational standpoint. Notice uh, the, the anthropomorphic context of God. What do I mean by that? The eyes of God, the ears of God, the face of God, right? We know this. The Bible says that God is spirit. God does not have a body like we do, and yet quoting from Psalm 34, it's using that language to remind ourselves that in, in terms of the, the perception of God and, and in terms of even the favor of God, each one of these speaks to a character trait of God where notice it says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The, the eyes of the Lord are, are essentially the protection. He looks ahead and he guards our ways, right? Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. He sees the way in front of you, and he will guide you in the right path. That's the language of eyes, right? The eyes of the Lord are on you. And, and again, th it would be easy to misinterpret that like, I'm watching you, right? I mean, that would, that would be kind of natural. I see you, the eyes of the Lord are on you. That's not what the psalm is saying. It's not like I see you like the eye of Sauron and I'm going to bore a hole in your soul. No, it's like I see the way in front of you and I'm going to guard and protect it. And then it says the ears of the Lord are open. This is something that's so fun when you read the Psalms. The psalmist will cry out, Lord, incline your ear to me. Well, we know what that means. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't hear things all that well. And so what do I have to do? I have to kind of cut my ear and kind of lean in. Anybody in the room, have, you don't have to show me, anybody in the room have a good ear and a bad ear? You know, where you have to kind of look this way or lean this or lean this way or whatever, right? That's the language of the psalmist. We know that God doesn't have hearing problems, but the psalmist literally cries out, God, incline your ear to me. And this is to show God's listening, but it's not just the act of listening, it's listening intently. It's listening with a desire and a yearning to hear. Uh, I run into this all the time, and I run into it with Adelaide, my daughter. Adelaide zones out, just like I do. I can be sitting in a room, this has happened too many times to count, I can be sitting in a room, whole conversation passes, I have zero idea what, what was spoken. Like, unless someone is speaking to me directly, I am not there. Um, and sometimes, this is what I've had to learn with Melissa, like, say we're driving in a car having a conversation, I might zone out for minutes at a time, and I will literally at times have to say, Melissa, I'm sorry, the last thing I remember you saying was this, can you please tell me again? And by the grace of God, Melissa has eventually caught on, like Tim's not being, he's not trying to be rude, it's just like literally, sometimes I'm just not there. Uh, it kind of drives me crazy with Adelaide, and I kind of feel sorry for people who have to deal with that with me. I'm trying, I'm working on it, but here's the point, incline your ear, God is intent, when, when I'll say it positively, you ever have someone in your life you feel like deeply listens to you? Isn't that such a huge blessing? When you feel like there's someone who deeply, intently wants to understand what's going on. That's what we all crave, right? That, that's what friendship, the essence of friendship is. Is someone who cares enough to say, I want to understand truly how you're feeling. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. That when the righteous come before God, and especially think of the context of Peter, righteous sufferers. When those who are suffering righteously cry out to God, his ears are open. He's listening. He's leaning in. He's intent. And then it says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. The face, this is easy to understand too, the face represents favor. Favor. 
Like when you turn your face from someone, it's a sign of shame, right? And, and there's all kinds of examples of this, and it's, and it's even common today. If you don't want to see someone, what do you do? You avoid eye contact with them. So to say that the face of the Lord is against those who do what's evil is to say God's face is not going to shine on them. Or even you think of this, the, the, the blessing of Aaron in Numbers chapter 6, when God tells the priests, when people come and sacrifice, this is what you're to say. It's a famous blessing. You've heard it. It's may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord do what? Make his face shine upon you. That God is looking fully upon you and may the light of his countenance shine on you. May you feel the gracious favor of God towards you. And Peter is saying, by contrast, God does not do that for the wicked, but he does do it for those who are righteous. Which is, again, what's his point? He's saying, Christian, don't give in to the compromise of righteousness. Don't give in to the ways of the world. Don't give in to the ways of deceit. Don't give in to the ways of darkness. And again, it goes back to your identity. You've been born again. You have a, an inheritance that's imperishable, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You're a royal priesthood, a holy generation, a royal nation, so that you may proclaim his praises. Walk in it. Live out your calling. And again, what do we come back to in, in chapter 3? It's all about imitating Christ. Did Christ ever waver in his righteousness? Of course, the answer is no. And even in context where it would, have, it would have been easy, it would have been advantageous in a sense for him. He suffered righteously, he suffered silently, and he entrusted himself to God. And so we read this. In verse 13, we continue the same logic. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Now, this is subtle, but this is important. I think what Peter is saying here is something very practical. He's essentially saying, you are going to be much less likely to suffer persecution if you live righteously, right? If you don't give anyone a reason to persecute you, it's going to be less likely that you experience persecution. Now, He's going to turn in the next verse and say, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But again, what does he say? Who then will harm you if you're devoted to what is good? Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. He's saying, make it, give yourself the best odds possible. Live a life that's full of righteousness. Live a life where someone has to lie about you to have anything on you. And then if you suffer... He says, you still are blessed. You still, and, and what is the blessing, by the way? The blessing isn't, oh, I feel happy because I'm being persecuted or I feel happy because people are coming against me. No, the blessing is knowing that God's favor, his eyes, his ears, his face are still inclined toward you, that you don't have to worry about your conscience. You don't have to worry about compromise. You know that you're in God's will, and that is the blessing, the blessing of being near to Jesus. And this is, by the way, this is one of those bitter blessings, right? Have you ever been, have you ever been in the context where, um, where someone uh, treated you wrongly and they felt like it was your fault, but in reality you knew you were trying to walk out what God wanted you to walk out? That can be miserable, but it's a whole lot better than the misery of sinning and knowing that it actually is your fault. It kind of goes back to the illustration that Kevin gave on Sunday. I thought it was a really great one. The guy who was, had stolen something for 15 years and knew it. And then when he actually confessed it, he had to go to prison. And someone said, man, prison must have been hard. And he said, it was nothing compared to the 15 years of me having to live with my own guilt. Right? This is where the blessing is the blessing of freedom. It's the blessing of knowing that before God, my conscience is clear. And that's why he says... But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. And then he says this, don't miss this. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. Don't fear what they fear or be intimidated. And this is where, this is where I want us to see the connection. Because the whole thing about an inheritance, the whole thing about being a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, all of that, it comes back to, to kind of bear fruit in this moment. Why do we not have to be afraid? Why do we have to not, why can we not be intimidated? It's because ultimately we know that the worst thing that someone can do to us is what? Take our life. But even then, suppose they do. We still have the inheritance. We still have the promise. We still have the living hope. This is where the resurrection gives us such confidence. 
that no matter what happens, we win in the end, which means let's say you experience persecution or let's say that someone comes and, and pressures you into to a moral compromise or that someone comes and, and, and you feel social pressure to, to maybe kind of tame down or tap, tamp down your Christianity or whatever. It's like, okay, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be intimidated. Why? Because we know that God's favor is on us and if God's favor is on us, we might have to pay the price. We might have to count the cost. That, those things genuinely may happen. But at the end of the day, we still have the favor of God, and we still have the hope of eternity. That's something that no one can take away. And here's, here's how Paul says it. And not exactly in the same way, but I, I think pretty similar. He talks about this in the book of Ephesians. That it's actually our boldness in Christ that is the sign both to the world and to the powers of darkness, that their rule and their reign has ended. This is, this, is what, this, this is the way that Jesus described it, right? Jesus said, don't fear those who can destroy the body and after that can do nothing, but rather fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And it's the fear of, and this is where, again, go back to what we talked about. I, I totally skipped this part, and I don't know why. I forgot about it. But, but Peter talked about the way we're to, to regard authorities, right? He says what? Uh, treat people with honor, uh, honor the emperor, fear God, honor the king. You remember the hierarchy that we talked about? We are to honor the emperor, even evil emperors. We are to regard with proper honor and respect those who hold positions of authority whether we agree with them or not. But when it comes to God, we fear God. Why? Because we know he's the one who ultimately we're going to stand before. We're not going to have to stand before the president of the United States. We're not going to have to stand before a governor or we're not going to have to stand before a board. We are going to stand before Jesus. And, and, and I think about this, and this, this doesn't make it easy, but I've shared this before, and I, I just I think about this sometimes. I think of the Apostle Paul. You remember the Apostle Paul, um, the book of Acts, toward the end of the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul is arrested, and the Jewish leaders want to kill him, but he eventually kind of goes to Caesarea Philippi. If you were on the Israel trip, you remember this was the prison that we got to see on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, where literally you can go there today, and you can see where Paul was when this happened. He's there in prison. And, and what happens, he basically goes before, uh, he goes before the governor, and uh, the governor invites, invites in King Herod, right? You have the Roman governor, you have the kind of like Israelite king of that kind of area. And what does it say? It says that the governor was there, and it says that the king and his wife came, and they came with all this pomp and circumstance. You have the governor, you have the king, you have the generals, you have all these people, and they're all as glorious and magnificent as they can make themselves to be. And then you have Paul who's in his chains, and I just can't help but think, Paul must have been so unimpressed because Paul had seen Jesus. It's like when you've seen the guy who makes the noon sun look like it's a shade spot, you think that somehow he was impressed with Herod Agrippa? Or you think he was somehow impressed by the generals of Rome? No. And how do we know, by the way? Because when he spoke with them, he spoke with boldness. He spoke with boldness about what? The death and burial and resurrection of Jesus and the judgment to come. And that's where, for sometimes it's not even what you say that speaks the, the, the loudest message. It's the genuine confidence that we have as followers of Christ that says, what can you do to me? To live as Christ and to die as gain. Now, even as we say that, easy to say, much harder to live. That same Paul, by the way, at the end of, I believe it's Philippians, says what? Pray for me that I might proclaim the gospel with boldness as I should. Paul had his struggles too. And he saw Jesus. Do we have struggles? Yeah, we do. But that's where the Spirit of God working in us gives us power and strength to overcome and when we do live with that boldness, that's a sign to both earthly and heavenly powers that their reign, their, their quote-unquote power, right, is really no power at all. But 
as we come to this, again, we're out of the, the household code context now, and now we're outward facing. Because what does he say? Don't fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. So now he's saying, okay, there are going to be those who are outside. There are going to be people who come and persecute us. We can't fall prey to sin. We can't give them a reason for accusation. But rather, regarding Christ as holy, and remember, holy means set apart. Holy means above and beyond the powers of this world. Regarding Christ as holy, he says, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have within you. Now, you can kind of see it there in your notes. Uh, the, the word for defense here is the word uh, apologia. It's where we get the word apologetics, right? To, to give an apology doesn't mean that you're saying, I'm sorry. The word apology most literally means a defense of why you are willing to follow Christ. Now, again, think of what Peter's saying. He's saying, okay, let's say you get accused or let's say that someone comes to you. Don't back down. Like, you know, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus. Ah, oh, no, it's not like that. No, yeah, I follow Jesus. I belong to him. Oh, well, you're a hypocrite. You know what? I do sin. But by the grace of God, I've been forgiven. Oh, well, Christianity is irrational. Well, I don't think it's irrational. Well, you know, whatever. I mean, it's like the defense might look different for different people. But notice, notice there's a particular context that Peter's talking about here. He says, always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that you have within you. What is that hope? Well, it's the same hope that we've been talking about. It's the hope of the resurrection. It's the hope of eternal life. The defense that every Christian have is, is, is ultimately, I have a hope and I, I'm defending the idea that the tomb is empty. I'm defending that I, the idea that Jesus proclaimed to be the Lord of life and then he was raised from the dead. That's the ultimate uh, defense of Christianity. And, and, and please listen, this is, uh, there is, there is a, a kind of movement that's popular uh, culturally in Christianity right now um, to say that our faith does not rise or fall on the Bible, but it rises or falls on the empty tomb. Um, there are various teachers who say that, and there are various teachers who then repeat it. Uh, there's a sense in which that's true. There's a sense in which that's incredibly wrong. Is it, let me explain the sense in which it's true. Is it true that at the end of the day, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then we of all people are most to be pitied, right? I mean, there is just a matter, there, there is a matter of fact. Everyone lives and everyone dies. Did Jesus of Nazareth die? Yes. A hundred out of a hundred people agree that Jesus died. Uh, actually, that's not true. There are some people who are uh, who deny that Jesus ever existed. If any, just just as this is a small footnote in your mind, if anyone ever comes to you with the argument that Jesus of Nazareth didn't exist, you immediately know that person has absolutely no clue what they're talking about. Okay, just there are some people who try to deny it. You might as well deny that Abraham Lincoln didn't exist. It's silly, but for for 99 out of 100 people who believe that Jesus existed, everyone agrees he died. And it is just the basic truth. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then Christianity is true. And if he wasn't, then it's false. Okay? The error that people commit is by trying to tear that away from the scriptures as the resource that God has given us to explain what the resurrection means. In other words, here's, here's, what, here's the, a very popular modern apologetic argument. They'll say, well, let's look at all the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and they'll try to say, well, you have these witnesses. You have James, he's one witness. You have John, you have Peter, you have Paul, you have Jude, you have, and there's more and less sophisticated ways to do it. But essentially, people will say, look at all these witnesses. We have firsthand accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. And, and, and please hear me, those things are all true. I think the apologetic arguments for the, the histor historical nature of the resurrection are incredibly strong. Don't get me wrong. But the error that people make is they want to say, well, let's just separate this apologetic argument for the resurrection from the scriptures themselves. At which point, if we do that, that is exactly what the apostles themselves refuse to do. In fact, and this is, this is, this is maybe like under the hood for me, 
That's why all the time I point out who were the old or who were the New Testament authors quoting? The Old Testament. Like the idea that they were trying to unhitch or in any way separate the historical case of the resurrection with the scriptures themselves is manifest nonsense. It's like the only way you could believe that is if you just don't read what the Bible says. And here's why. And I'm going to say this again. If it doesn't make sense, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Here's why. If Jesus was truly raised from the dead, Christianity is true. If, it's, if he wasn't, then it's false. But how do we know what that means? How do we know what that means for us? How do we know God's purposes in raising Jesus from the dead? How do we know what it means for us in terms of living it out? The only way we know that is by receiving the scriptures as God's direction and receiving it as his gift and as his guide. So the idea that we can somehow separate the apologetic value of the scriptures, and they do have apologetic value, they are eyewitness accounts. All of those things are true. But the idea that you can somehow separate the apologetic value of the Bible from the, the, uh, the inspiration of the Bible or the reception of the Bible as a gift from God is, is a fallacy. And it's a fallacy that unfortunately, here's what it does. It leads people to say, well, okay, I can believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but I don't believe I have to do anything the Bible says. Literally, that, that would be the logical conclusion. And, and literally, it's what happens. The people who tend to argue, well, yeah, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. There's all these witnesses. There's all this evidence. And there is. There's great witnesses. There's great evidence. But they tend to say, oh, well, what the rest of the Bible says really is secondary. It really doesn't matter. Meanwhile, here, here's, the, here's the basic way to simplify it. If, you've, if I've lost you, then come back to me here. Here's the thing. If it's true that God raised Jesus from the dead... Or if it's true that Jesus was raised from the dead, it's true because God raised him from the dead. And God also gave us the Bible as the authoritative guidebook for life. He did both. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same God who gave us the Bible as our guide for life. And so I think it's very dangerous when people try to separate the apologetic value of the New Testament from the authority of the, te of the New Testament in our lives. And here's, here's why they do that, to, to give them their, their, their argument. Here's why they do that. They'll say, listen, if you're trying to win someone to Christ, you shouldn't try to have to convince them that the New Testament is authoritative. All you should try to convince them of is that Jesus rose from the dead. They say, play to your strengths. It's a strong argument. Play to your strengths. Don't try to, you know, don't try to do what you did three weeks ago, Tim, and have a conversation about slavery, or don't try to do the whole conversation about the treatment of women, or don't try to lump in the Old Testament there and have to explain the genocide in the Old Testament or what they call genocide. Don't do that. Leave behind all the baggage. And just take the apologetic arguments and use those. That's what they want to do. But meanwhile, again, this is where I say the same God who raised Jesus also gave us the Bible. And, and please hear me. God did not give us the Bible with kind of rosy cheeks saying, well, I'm kind of embarrassed of this. Really proud of the resurrection, but I'm really embarrassed of the Bible. God did not do that. And therefore, we shouldn't do it either. Um, I didn't really intend to talk about that tonight, but... Uh, but here's my point. <laughs> Essentially, those arguments are human beings saying, we know better how to defend God than God knows how to defend himself. It really is. It's the idea that we know better how to, to, to win people to Christ than the apostles did. And, and again, this is... Uh, this is what the, the counter-argument would be. Here's what they would say. They would say, no, that's not true. What we're trying to do is what Paul did in Acts chapter 17. When you're approaching people who don't believe the Bible is Scripture, then you shouldn't start out by using the Bible as your defense. That's what they would say. But the problem, and here's, I'll just say this and then I'm done. We'll keep moving. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that many of the modern apologetic arguments do not simply say, well, we want to meet them where they're at on common ground. They literally will we'll try to cut and separate the scriptures from the resurrection. And you can't do that. It, they are implicitly trying to say the scriptures themselves are just not important. And the teachings of, scriptures, uh, of the scriptures are, are not necessary. 
And all day long, they'll say that's not true, but it is. And that's why you have basically the same people who are saying the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. And again, please hear me say this. There are very strong and great defenses of the resurrection. There are. But we just cannot use the scriptures for their apologetic value and then just discard the rest of them. And we can't do that either in word or in deed, which my fear is that that does happen. If you have no clue what I'm talking about, count yourself lucky. This is the last thing we'll say. We aren't going to get through all of it. Um, Notice what Peter says. Ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Verse 16, yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you're accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. This is pretty, this is pretty straightforward. Honestly, it's, it's hard to miss this. Peter is saying, it's not just having a good argument. You can't just go to people and say, well, here's all the evidence for the resurrection. Or here's all the evidence for why the Bible's true. Or here's all the evidence for whatever you want all the evidence for. If you speak the truth, but you don't speak the truth in love, what is the takeaway of the person that you're going to speak to? They're not going to accept what you say. You might have the best argument in the world. But if they perceive that you are being disrespectful or you're being unkind, they're going to go away not caring about your argument. They're going to care about how you treated them. Peter says, we are always to, and and again, we are to approach the world with gentleness and respect. Gentleness, right? You know what gentleness is? Gentleness is understanding understanding what you are handling. You know, sometimes people people associate gentleness with weakness. And that's why, by the way, I, I mean... The Bible talks about gentleness a lot. Um, the New Testament, I, I forget how many times it uses the word gentleness, but it's several times. Let your, the, always be gentle in your speech. Be gentle in the way that you approach unbelievers. Um, gentleness is literally a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that we don't produce in ourselves. It's something the Spirit produces in us. What is gentleness? Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is not like wimpiness. Gentleness is considering what it is you're handling and handling it appropriately. Uh, Adeline, my daughter, when she was born, she was in the NICU for over three weeks. And she was so small, she was so tiny that she, I mean, literally, it was like you could hold her. She was born, I think, 414, got down to 47. We literally had to go, Alvin and Debbie went into Build-A-Bear workshop and got clothes because they didn't have clothes small enough for her, literally. Um, And... After a few days, I got to hold her for the first time. And listen, gentleness doesn't mean weakness. It means consideration of what it is you are handling. And that's where, again, I think think there is a lot of room for error with Christians when they approach unbelievers, and rather than approaching a conversation with gentleness and respect... A lot of times they want to come in and say, well, man, I've got all these great arguments and man, you know, whatever. It's like, you've got to know who you're talking to. And you've got to understand that most people, this is at least how I feel, and you can feel free to disagree with me. Most people, when you're engaging with them in conversation, they care just as much, if not more, about the way you are approaching them than what you're telling them. There's a proverb that that says this, a gentle tongue can break a bone. The way we approach people is crucial. And, and, and listen, that's both true just from like a kindness standpoint, but it's also true from a pragmatic standpoint. You are never going to submit yourself to someone that you know is being mean or rude to you. What happens? It happens for all of us. We just, ugh. You may be right, but I'll never admit that. That's why Peter says, Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you're accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. Give them them no reason to blame you. If someone tries to accuse you, make sure that people will think that's crazy. There's no way. Make them have to make something up about you. Think of Daniel, right? 
What did the people around Daniel know? There was no way that they could ever have anything on Daniel unless it was something having to do with his God. So they literally had to set a trap. And of course, all of this is going back to your good conduct in Christ. For, verse 17, it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. So when we think about Jesus, right? Jesus suffered for doing good. Why? Because it was God's will. And this is where, by the way, there's, there's an encouragement even amidst the pain. What's the encouragement? Is that God is so powerful, he is able to take our unjust suffering, and just like he used it for good with Jesus, he's able to take our unjust suffering and use it for good with others. Uh, let me give you this last, last thought, and then we'll uh, just have some dialogue here. This is... Um, This is a hard way to reach people, but it's also pretty effective. Uh, I'll give two examples. I'll give one that's non-biblical, then I'll give one that's biblical. Ben Franklin, uh, ben Franklin was really good friends with the evangelist George Whitfield. George Whitfield was from England. Uh, he came over to the United States and had several different crusades. Ben Franklin was a very famous skeptic, um, very openly skeptical of really any kind of faith claim at all. And, uh, but Ben Franklin wanted to go see George Whitfield, and uh, George Whitfield would always take up offerings for uh, the orphanage project that he supported, and Ben Franklin told someone, he's like, yeah, I'm going to go uh, listen to George Whitfield, and, uh, but he said, he's not getting anything from me. You know, he's a skeptic again. And, uh, but by the end of it, this guy who Ben Franklin had talked to saw that Ben Franklin emptied his pockets and put a pretty nice gold watch in the offering uh, to give to the orphanage. And the guy came to him and said, you know, Dr. Franklin said, why would you do that? He said, we know you don't believe this. And here's what Ben Franklin replied. He said, you know what? You're right. I don't believe it. But he does. Pointing to George Whitfield. And what he, what he was meaning by that is saying the purity and the truthfulness of Whitfield moved Ben Franklin. That's what Peter's saying. He's saying, listen, don't be intimidated. Don't back down. Be bold. Be real. That's the unbiblical example. The biblical example is Stephen, right? You remember Stephen when he was martyred? That he literally stands before the Sanhedrin, and that story is recorded. Who was there? Paul. Now, of course, Paul had his Damascus Road, but that story went down in history with Stephen. Why? Because it made an impact. It made an impact to know that Stephen was willing to die literally at the hands of all the people that he had respected in his life. He was willing to die for what he knew to be true. And this is where it's a hard way to witness, but if we are willing to truly suffer righteously for what we believe, that sends a message. And sometimes that sends a message that's way more powerful and way more, way more in a sense, accepted than any argument that we could contrive about the resurrection of the scriptures or whatever. Like truly just living out, no, we believe this. And we believe it even when it comes at great cost. At least at that point, there's no confusion that, hey, maybe you're just using this to your own advantage or all the other skeptical things that people think of Christians. No, like I believe this and I'm willing to put my life down on the line for it. And again, what am I saying? For it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. That's exactly what Jesus did. I'll just read this next verse, then we'll stop. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. We read, or we talked about this when we read through 1 Peter. But for Peter, just like for Paul, the life of Jesus truly redefined everything for him. And for Peter, the rest of his life, he said, I want to follow Christ's example. I want to follow his example in suffering righteously, Jesus died for sins, but his model is a model that we are to, to walk after, all right? Hey, let's stop right there. We didn't obviously get through everything. If you're interested, next week, we're going to talk about Jesus descending and preaching proclamation to the spirits imprisoned during Noah's time. So if that kind of floats your boat, there you go, oh, there you go. If that floats your boat, then you can come next week. Any, we got some time for thoughts or questions. Yeah, Taylor.